been putting off cutting my yard for about three weeks because it was starting to look a little ragged, but I didn't really want get, to get out there and fight all that dust. And I cut it Friday, and it was bad. It was dusty, and then, and then it rained afterward. I said, just my luck. I should have cut it two weeks ago because that was going to make it rain. But anyway, I'm glad to see the rain. I know probably you are too. It cooled things off a little bit and, and uh, kind of refreshed everything a little bit. But it's good to see you here this morning. We have a beautiful morning this morning. It's good to be able to come out and be in the house of the Lord today. I'm, I'm glad to be here myself, and I'm certainly glad that uh, you are here. Let's go ahead and get started this morning, and uh, maybe we can get through on time. That would be a blessing if, that, if we could do that, but we'll, we'll see if we can. But uh, if you'll think back to last week, our lesson last week was uh, entitled Obadiah, and it's God's Prophet of Doom. And uh, we learned that uh, not only is the book Obadiah, the book of Obadiah, a book of uh, prophecy, uh, which of course pronounces doom on the nation of Edom, and we looked at all of that last week and talked about why, but also we learned that the book of Obadiah contains a message for us today about the spiritual battle that takes place within all of us. If you are a born-again child of God, there's a spiritual battle that takes place. And it's a daily battle. It's a daily struggle. And uh, I know that all of you, as uh, saved people, as born-again people, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know about that struggle uh, between the flesh and between the spirit that rages within us sometimes. And, uh, you know, we, when we think about that, you know, we're talking about saved people. Lost people don't have that battle. I mean, they're not saved. They don't have a spiritual nature within them. They sin because that's what they do. That's what they are. That's what they know. They're lost. And there's not a battle taking place within them. But for saved people, there's a struggle because when we sin, we know better. We know better. And, uh, and sometimes in spite of the fact that we know better, we, we tend to do it anyway. And when we do that, we're giving in to the flesh. And when we're able to overcome those things, then we're, we're leaning on the Spirit. So uh, we learned uh, last week that in the book of Obadiah, as we looked at it and read it, that Israel represents the spiritual life of a believer, and Edom represents the fleshly life or the fleshly nature that's present uh, in all of us. And, uh, you know, I believe the great lesson for us from the book of Obadiah last week is that uh, if we're truly born again, and there's the big if. If is a little bitty word. But it's got a, but there's a whole lot in the word if. If we belong to the Lord. If we are truly born again, no matter what happens, we'll win. That's what uh, Brother Stephan was talking about this morning. We can be encouraged in the fact that if we're born again, all these troubles that we deal with, all these battles that we deal with, the, the, the troubles of life, the sickness and the death and the deals that, and the things that we deal with on a daily basis, those things will soon be passed away. If we're truly born again, no matter what happens in our life, we're going to win. In the end, we win. And we should be encouraged in that today. The flesh cannot win. Think about it. The flesh cannot win and the spirit cannot lose if you're born again. We're told that in the word of God. We can take comfort in that. We can trust in that today and we can rejoice in that. Now that doesn't mean that life won't be tough. That doesn't mean that we won't have to deal with things that, uh, that are not easy. Folks, we, I've never found anywhere in the Word of God where it says if we would trust in the Lord, from that day on, our life would be easy and everything would be good. I've never seen that. There is no promise of that in the Word of God. But we do know that while there will be difficult times, we know what the end is. And we know where we'll be in the end. You know, there will always be those like Edom. What, was the, what, what did we learn about the people of Edom last uh, week? There's going to always be people like that who will stand by and do nothing when action is needed. Folks, we have people in our church today doing that, standing by doing nothing when action is needed. In other words, there's things that need to be done in the church, and people are standing by and don't do it. For whatever reason, they're not doing it. We're not doing it. There's going to always be people like that that will stand by and do nothing when action is needed. There will also always be those 
who will rejoice in the downfall and the destruction of the work of God. Believe it or not, there are people who do not want to see the work of God succeed. Believe it or not, when we were in a period of growth in this church, believe it or not, there were people in other churches, supposedly saved people now, that were critical of that. There may have been people in our own church critical of it. Don't want to see the work of God prosper. I can't imagine somebody that's truly born again not wanting to see the work of God prosper. But there are those out there that claim to be saved that are just that way. There's also those who will join in and help against the work of the church. You know, there's people in church, by the way, who call themselves Christians that are not for anything. They're against everything. Anything they can do to hinder the work of God, they're for it. Note that those are things just like the people of Edom we learned last week. You know, they didn't necessarily run in and attack, but they were kind of cheering on the enemy. They were standing by watching what happened. Watching what happened to God's people, rejoicing in their demise, and then benefiting from their loss. And there's going to always be people like that. But we can rejoice in the end. Thanks be to God that there will always be the will of God and the word of God for a child of God. We can always trust. While we can't trust in, in, in the world, while we can't always trust in people that, that we think are our friends, we can't even always trust in our family. We can always trust in the Lord. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. His word promises us that. And if we'll put our faith and our trust in him and follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit and live by the teachings of the word of God, the flesh will perish and the spirit will endure for all eternity. Folks, that ought to, that ought to bless your heart this morning. Regardless of what we go through, if we'll put our trust in the Lord, if we'll follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit, if we'll live according to the word of God, now, and if we're going to live according to the word of God, we've got to know the word of God. We've got to open and read it. But if we'll do those things, then we, our eternity is secure. We know where we'll spend eternity. We know what lies ahead for us. And it's all good at that point. Now, in today's lesson, we're talking about Jehu, and I'm not real good with names, so I may be mispronouncing this, but we're talking about Jehu, God's tool of retribution. We're going to talk about retribution or vengeance a little bit today. You know, and... Uh, our lesson is taken from uh, 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10. And uh, it would do you well. I'm not going to, for the sake of time, go back and read a, a lot of additional scripture this morning. But it would do you well to go back and read that. And, uh, and, and, and I'm going to talk about some background things to bring us up. But we're going to uh, not go back and read all those additional scriptures this morning for the sake of time. But I do encourage you to read 2 Kings chapters 9 and 10 in their entirety. Uh, but we'll see today that God's promises and prophecies are always true and they'll always be fulfilled. Don't, don't ever doubt the word of God. Don't ever doubt the promises of God. If God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And you say, well, you know, it's easy for us to look back and see where something was prophesied and it took place. And we're going to talk about that today. We'll see an example of that today. But what does that have to do with us? Folks, there are some prophecies that have not yet been fulfilled, but I can assure you they will. And as we look at today's lesson, this is an example of how God keeps his promises and fulfills his prophecies. And if God kept his promises in the past and fulfilled his prophecies in the past, I can assure you he will in the future. And so let, let's, let's think about that a little bit as we look at today's lesson. You know, sometimes it even seems like to us that maybe God has forgotten about his promises. You ever felt like maybe God has forgotten about you? Have, have things kind of got heavy on you at times? And boy, it just seems like the Lord has forgotten about you. It just seems like that uh, everything you do just doesn't work out. It just seems like you don't feel the blessings of the Lord like you used to. Probably all of us have been in that place at some point in time, but I can assure you this morning, God has not forgotten his promises. God will keep his promises, 
You know, when we start feeling like that, we're discouraged. We're discouraged. And folks, at, at times, all of us need to be encouraged. We need to, and we can find encouragement from the Word of God. If we dwell on things that we're dealing with that are problems every day, we'll, we'll never be encouraged. We'll never be encouraged. We need to look to the Word of God for encouragement. But the simple fact is, that we should never forget or ignore the promises of God because they will come to pass in God's time. In God's time. The Word of God teaches us that His ways are much higher than our ways. His understanding much greater than ours. He knows when we need what we need. And He'll take care of it. And so we need not worry about that. You know, God keeps His promises. He fulfills His prophecies. When he is ready. Not on our timetable, but when he's ready. So, if we think back to some previous lessons, we've been talking this quarter about idolatry. Idolatrous worship uh, that had become prevalent, really, among God's, quote, chosen people. Idolatry had become prevalent among God's people. And we're talking about, even in Israel and, and Judah at this time, uh, People were worshiping idols. They had turned from God and they had turned to idols. And we've been looking at that week after week after week. The demise of different people and even the demise of God's people because they would not heed to the word of God. In today's lesson, we'll be talking about Joram, who was the son of uh, Ahab and king of Israel, and his idolatrous worship. We'll also be talking about uh, King Uzziah, king of Judah, who was also an idolatrous worshiper. He was, in fact, a follower of Baal. So we're talking about the king of Israel and the king of Judah worshiping idols. This is the state of God's people at this point. Obviously, these two men were evil. They were idolaters. They were trying to lead God's people and they were not following the Lord. And you say, well, the Lord has let all this take place. God said he was going to preserve his people. God said his people would be protected. The nation of Israel would always stand. How is it they've got a person who is serving as king of Israel who is worshiping idols? How could God promise to preserve his people and allow that to happen? Well, understand, God's not going to always allow things like that to happen. God will take care of it when the time is right. And, of course, we're going to see that in today's lesson. You see, the time, as we look at the lesson today and as we read our text verses, the time had come for God to fulfill his promises and his prophecies to Elijah. And uh, to do this, God chose Jehu, who is the subject of our lesson today. Now, he was a captain in the army of Israel, uh, from all indications, a valiant soldier, a good soldier, one who put his calling first. He was fearless. He was ready to do whatever he was commanded and called to do. And we'll see in, in today's lesson that uh, even though uh, God called him, and we'll talk about God called him, God anointed him, and made him king of Israel, but Jesus had some problems, didn't he? If you've read this lesson and you've prepared uh, studied the lesson a little bit today, you know he had some issues of his own. Jehu was not a perfect man. He was not a man sold out to God, even though God used him to do some good things. There's a lesson in that for us today, too, by the way. But God used him to accomplish some things, but he had some issues, and we'll get to those issues a little bit later. But I want you to understand something, and I want you to think about this as we read about Jehu, and we go through all the things that he did, and then we find out a little uh, interesting fact about Jehu at the end. It was a problem for him. I want you to consider this. Sometimes God uses people who are not sold out to him to accomplish his will and his purpose. Now, I'm going to ask you a question at the end of the lesson today. In fact, I'll go ahead and ask it now so you can be thinking about it. Is God using you today to accomplish his will and his purpose? Is God using you today? 
Now, only you can answer that question. Are you, have you, are you being used by God? Has God? Have you allowed God to use you? Are you doing anything to further the kingdom of God? I can't answer that question for you, and you can't answer it for me. But that's a look in the mirror. Are you doing anything to further the kingdom of God on a daily basis? That's a hard question, isn't it? It's a hard question. Because you need to be truthful with yourself. What are you doing to further the kingdom of God? And then the next question is this. Is God using you in spite of the fact that you hadn't sold out to him? If God is using you, if you're doing anything for God, is he using you in spite of you? Or is he using you because you are sold out to God? Willing to go wherever he says go and do whatever he says do. Now, those are two pretty hard questions. They're personal questions that only you know the answer to. I'm not standing here today and saying, well, I don't think this person over here is doing anything for God, and I think this person is doing a lot. I don't know what you do every day, nor do you know what I do every day. I don't know what's in your heart. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what the Lord's called you to do, and I don't know what your response to God is. I don't even know whether you're sold out to the Lord wholeheartedly or not. Folks, you can be saved and not sold out to God. You can be saved and holding out on God. But if you fall in that category, if you're a saved person holding out, not doing anything for God, you better look out. God will not allow you to continue in that state. Trouble is right around the beam. God wants to use us. If we will not allow ourselves to be used of God, what good are we? If God were through with us, he'd take us home. You might say, well, you know, I've, I've done this for all these years, and I've done that for all these years, and I've been faithful for all these years. It's time for somebody else to do something. Ever felt that way? When it's time for somebody else to do something, you know what the Lord's going to do? He's going to take you home, and somebody else will have to step in and do something. But until such time, we ought to remain faithful. We ought to remain willing servants of the Lord. There's something we can do in our service to God. Every one of us, God is equipped to do something. Are we doing it? Why are we doing it? Are we sold out to God or are we not? Well, in today's lesson, Jehu was a man that was not sold out to God. And so as we look at today's lesson, uh, consider these questions that we just talked about. And we'll see hopefully at the end, where you stand in your walk with the Lord. Let's begin with our uh, first verses here in our text, 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 5 through 7. And when he came, behold, the captains of the host were sitting. And he said, I have an errand to thee, O captain. And Jehu said, unto which of all us? And he said, to thee, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head, and he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel, and, and thou shalt smite the house of Ahab thy master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. See, the time for, of reckoning, as we like to say, the time of reckoning has come for Ahab and Jezebel and all of his family. The time is at hand. The Lord's going to take care of some things. And Jehu's going to be the man to do it. But leading up to this, if you go back and read some verses leading up to this, Elisha called one of the sons of the prophets to him and said, gave him a mission. You go to Jehu and you anoint him king. You call him off, tell him you need to meet with him in private. You anoint him with oil as king of the children of Israel. You give him the mission. You tell him what he's supposed to do, and then you leave. Whether Jehu would respond to that was an interesting thing in and of itself. How he would react to being anointed king and given this mission to do. So that, those were the instructions. And then after those instructions, we pick up in verse 5 where the prophet had gone to Jehu, he has approached him here and he wants to meet with him. That's what we're reading about in verse 5. That's where it picks up. So 
So the prophet goes to him, and he did just as he was instructed. He calls Jehu to meet with him individually. He uh, anoints him king. He pours the oil on his head. He anoints him king over Israel in verse 6 there. And then he gave uh, Jehu the instructions in verse 7. Told him what he was to do. So let's look at these verses again. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured oil on his head and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed thee king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. So Jehu is called aside. He's anointed king of Israel. And then in verse 7, he's given a job to do. Can you imagine being called in as king and, or being called in and all of a sudden you've been anointed king over God's people and you're being told this is what God said you must do. And he's given this mission, this, this mission or this uh, message from the, uh, by the prophet to avenge the blood of the servants of God. So, obviously here God was using Jehu to avenge the death of people that were killed by Ahab and Jezebel, specifically the death of Naboth. Remember, that was what we talked about at the very beginning of this quarter. How Ahab wanted that vengeance. And all, Naboth was just a man that was trying to follow the word of God. And because he took a stand and said, I'm going to do this because it's the right thing, he, he lost his life. And his family members lost their life. Because he took a stand to do what's right. And it looked like at that time, all the way up to this point, Ahab and Jezebel had got away with it. They killed a good man, quote, a man trying to do what's right, and they took his property. And the only reason they killed him is because they wanted what he had. And they got away with it. Folks, have you ever looked around at people and said, I don't understand? I'm struggling every day. And I see people up and down the road living like the devil himself and they seem to prosper. Why is it so hard for me and my family to, to do, try to do what's right? And everywhere we turn, there's trouble. You ever felt that way? And other people just won't do what's right and they seem to prosper. It's not just you. That happened to Naboth. He tried to do what's right and it cost him his life. It cost all of his family their lives. And the people who actually did it to him, killed him and took his property, prospered. Prospered. For a while. For a while. That's what we don't understand. See, eventually that day of reckoning is coming. The Lord will deal with it. If we'll just turn it over to God, he'll deal with it when it's time. And there were those, I can assure you, that looked around and saw what happened to Naboth that were saying, man, I can't believe this. I just can't believe they got away with that. They got away with it. I can't believe it. They got away with it. They didn't get away with it. God saw it. God knew about it. And God was going to deal with it when he was ready. See, that's having faith in the Lord. We need to have that kind of faith. We need to understand that God's going to deal with things. It's not for us to worry about. We need to worry about us. What is my walk with the Lord like? Where am I with the Lord today? Not what somebody else is doing. Not what somebody else is getting away with. The Lord will take care of it. So, as we look on, I want to read a verse to you, and I, I looked this verse up. I knew what it said, but I couldn't remember what chapter and verse. But you know, these people thinking that Ahab and Jezebel got away with murder, and they were prospering and all of that, and couldn't believe nobody really took a stand against them. People watched it. They got away with it. How so? Romans chapter 12 and verse 19 says, and folks, it would do us well to commit this verse to memory. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, 
saith the Lord. The Lord's going to take care of it. In due time, the Lord will take care of it. Vengeance is not yours. Vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is the Lord's. And he will deal with it. Folks, it's not for you and I to go out and deal with those issues. That's for God. Let's continue. 2 Kings 9, verse 21. And Joram said, Make ready, and his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Uzziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot. And they went out against Jehu and met him in the portion of Naboth, of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And it came to pass, when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, What peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. He wasn't coming in peace. And Joram turned his hands and fled and said, Uzziah, there is treachery, O Uzziah. And Jehu drew a bow with his full strength and smote Joram between his arms. And the arrow went out of his heart, and he sank down in his chariot. Then said Jehu to Bidkar, his captain, Take up and cast him in the portion of the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite. For remember how that when I and thou rode together after Ahab his father, the Lord laid this burden upon him. Surely I have seen yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his son, saith the Lord, and I will requite thee in this plat, saith the Lord. Now therefore take and cast him into the plat of ground according to the word of the Lord. But when Uzziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled by way of the garden house. And Jehu followed him, followed after him, and said, Smite him also in the chariot. And they did so at the going up of Gur, which is by Eblom. And uh, he fled to Megiddo and died there. Now, as we look at these verses, get a little background here. Uh, we see that... Uh, Obviously, Jehu has accepted his anointing, and he starts out to do what he's been told to do. He's now anointed king. He's been told what he must do, so he's, he's set out to do it. And so he immediately began to follow these instructions that were given him by the prophet, and, and his first step was to lead his army to Jezreel and to find Jor Joram, king of Israel. And so as Jehu was approaching, uh, Joram sees him coming, he don't know who he is, so he sends out a messenger. And you, you've got to go back and read some additional verses leading up to this to get the gist here. But he sends a messenger out. And the messenger approaches Jehu, and he wants to know who he is and why he's going. And he tells him, you better join with us. And so he does. That messenger stays with, with Jehu. He sends out another messenger. That messenger, same thing. He doesn't return either. So Joram is concerned. His messengers have gone out. They haven't come back. And he's looking and he's trying to figure out. And then somebody, they get close enough that somebody says, that's Jehu and his army. So he tells him to get his chariot ready and he rides out to meet him himself. And that's where we pick up. He rides out to meet him. Look at verse 21. And Joram said, uh, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. And Joram, king of Israel, and Uzziah, king of Judah, went out, each in his own chariot, against Jehu, and met him in the portion of Naboth the Jezreelite. Here's what's interesting. It's a little bit of irony, I guess, if, if, if you will, here. Because these two evil kings ride out to meet Jehu in the garden, in the land, in the property of Naboth. That land that they had stole is taking place there again. They took it. They killed a man for that piece of ground, and they're about to die on it. God said they would. God said that he would take care of it. He's taking care of it. So they ride out there, and he says, he sees Jehu, and he asks him, are you coming in peace? And in a very direct way, he lets him know he's not coming in peace. Look at what he tells him. Verse uh, 22, and it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu, that he said, is it peace, Jehu? He asked him that question, you coming in peace? And his response, what peace? So long as the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. In other words, as long as, as, as your mother's 
actions and things that she's done and all of this stuff's going on, there won't be any peace. What Jehu is really doing and what he's really saying is that he's coming to make peace. Peace is about to be taking place, but it's not going to include you. And so at that point then, uh, Joram realizes why Jehu has come. And he tries to run. And he tells uh, Uzziah that it's treachery. It's treachery. What is treachery? What does that mean? Deception is what he's talking about. We thought he was coming in peace. He's not coming in peace. This is treachery. He's turned against us. He's the captain of an army and he's turned against us. This is treachery. And so he begins to run. But we see that Jehu drew his bow and he shot him as he was running. And the arrow went in his back and came out his heart. And he died in his chariot. And uh, so instructions are given what to do with him there. Jehu ordered his captain to throw his body in the field of Naboth. Throw his body out there in the field of Naboth. This is, this is fulfilling prophecy, folks. God keeping his promise. Then we see that Jehu continued on his mission. Again, remember, what was his mission? To smite the house of Ahab. Ahab and Jezebel's sin was about to be brought to uh, fruition. It was about to be dealt with. All of them were going to die. He was given the order to smite the house of Ahab. So he's on that quest to do that. And we see in verse 27 that Isaiah, king of, of uh, Judah, saw what happened with Joram. So he knew what was coming next. So he takes off. He flees. And the order is given by Jehu to pursue after him that he must also be killed. He's shot in his chariot, but he flees on, and he ends up dying in Megiddo, according to the word of God. So both of these evil kings that we started out with are now dead, as we uh, see in these verses that we've just read. So let's continue reading. Uh, let me get to my verses here. Second Kings chapter 9, we'll read. It kind of skips around here. And we're going to read just what's in the book, but I'm going to talk about some things, find some other verses, and I'll try to point those verses out to you. Verse 30, and when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her hair and looked out at a window. And then it skips to verse 33. We'll talk about what's in verses 31 and 32. But in verse 33 it says, and he said, throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of her blood was sprinkled on the wall and on the horses, and he trod her underfoot. And when he was come in, he did eat and drink, and said, Go, go, she now, excuse me, go see now this cursed woman, and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. And they went out to bury her, but they found no more of her than the skull and the feet and the palms of her hands. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel, and the carcass of Jezebel shall be as dung upon the face of the field in the portion of Jezreel, so that they shall not say, This is Jezebel. And that's what the prophet Elijah said would happen to him. Well, it just happened. God fulfilled his promise, the prophets, or the prophecies. Then you skip to 2 Kings chapter 10 and verse 10. Now, know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord hath done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, and all his great men and his kinfolk and his priests, until he left him none remaining. He took care of every one of them just like he was instructed to do. So let's look back at these verses and kind of see what happened. We see here that, uh, you know, thinking back, Jehu had gotten there. He had already taken care of uh, Joram and, uh, and uh, the name just left me. Anyway, he had already taken care of those two kings that were, that were uh, 
practicing idolatry, ruling over God's people. They were gone. They were dead. So obviously Jezebel's heard about this. So she gets ready. She gets on her best attire. She puts the makeup on. She does her hair. And she's sitting in the window waiting for him to get there. And when he arrives, he calls out. He sees her, and he calls out to her servant. And he asks, is there one loyal to me? The Bible says two or three eunuchs said yes. When those two or three said yes, he said, go get her and throw her out. And they did. They threw her out the window right where she sat. She hit the ground. The Bible says her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses, and they rode right over the top of her and went into the city. That's fulfilling the prophecy. That's fulfilling the prophecy. So all of this takes place, and we read of this in these verses. And, uh, and after he's ridden over and they've gone in, at this point Jehu enters into the city, and, and the Bible says he did eat and he did drink. And then he ordered his men, he began to think about it. You know, she was, in fact, the king's daughter. She's evil. She's all of those things. But out of respect for the fact that she, she in fact, was a king's daughter, go bury her. So they go out to bury her, but what do they find? Look in verse 34 there at the end of the verse. Go see now this cursed woman and bury her, for she's a king's daughter. But when the men went out to bury her, they, all they could find was, if we look at verse 35 there at the end of the verse, they found a skull, the feet, and the palms of her hands. That's all that was left. That's all that was left of her. Wild dogs had taken care of her body. So Jezebel had died just like God said she would. The prophecy had been fulfilled. So if we, if we think about that now, we've got the kings are killed, we've got Jezebel killed, Ahab is dead. And if you read on and continue reading through chapters, chapter 10, you'll find that uh, later Jehu, Jehu even uh, executed the remaining sons of Ahab, all of those we just read, uh, everybody that was associated with him, he killed them. It was over with so that there was none left to assume the throne. Nobody left in Ahab's family that could assume the throne. God had fulfilled his promise. The house of Ahab was destroyed. But now let's look at one other thing. Look at verse 31 of 2 Kings chapter 10. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel. That's important. Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam which made Israel to sin. Jehu had accepted his appointment as king. He had carried out the mission that he was given. God had allowed him to do that. God ordered that he be ordained king, that he be anointed king of Israel, and he was. God had given him a mission to do. It was given him, and he did it. But here's the catch. You might look at everything we've set up to this point and say, man, Jehu was a mighty man of God. A mighty man of God. Jehu was not a mighty man of God. Because Jehu had a little problem. And verse 31 tells us what that problem is. But if we think, before we read that verse again, if we think about everything that Jehu had accomplished, let's look at it. He was chosen by God. He was anointed king. He destroyed the prophets of Baal and all the images of Baal. He destroyed the house of Ahab. God used him in a mighty way to do some great things. But look at verse 31. Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sin of Jer Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. What was the sin of Jeroboam? Anybody know? What was the sin of Jeroboam that the Bible says Jehu departed not from? It says he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam. Idolatry. Idolatry. The very thing that he destroyed, he couldn't give up himself. 
See, Jeroboam had made two golden calves, and the people of Israel worshipped him. So the sin of Jeroboam was idolatry, and Jehu not only refused to destroy the golden calves, he, he worshipped them himself. He destroyed the prophets of Baal. He destroyed all the things that represented Baal. He got rid of that. He got rid of the, the kings who were idolatrous people because God said to. So he destroyed the prophets of Baal. He got rid of kings that were idol worshipers. He even destroyed the house of Ahab because they were evil people that worshipped idols and sinned against God. But he himself was holding on to some sin. See, even though God was using him, he was not completely sold out to God. And so because of Jehu's sin, God would allow the territory of Israel to gradually shrink until it was eventually overrun by the Assyrians. You see, God used Jehu to carry out his prophecy. God used Jehu to keep his promise, but Jehu wasn't faithful. Thus, the question I asked you at the beginning of the class today, is God using you? Is God using you? And if he is, is he using you in spite of you and in spite of the sin in your life, or are you sold out to God? See, my point is, you can be serving in the church and not be sold out to God. You can be teaching Sunday school and not be sold out to God. You can be teaching Awana and not be sold out to God. You can be a, a deacon or on the finance committee and not be sold out to God. You can even be the pastor and not be sold out to God. You can just be somebody sitting on the pew and not be sold out to God. So my question for you this morning is, are you sold out to the Lord? Or are you holding on to sin, things that you know are not right, things that you know need to go, are you doing things that you know you ought not be doing? But you just won't give it up. You just won't sell out to God. Or are you sold out to God? I'm just asking questions for thought. I'm not pointing fingers at anybody this morning. I want you to think. I want you to really think where you stand with the Lord. Are you doing, you know, we, we run sprints at the end of practice every day. And I, I don't really fuss at kids anymore about not running hard like I used to. I, I fuss in a new way. When they, after they run, when they loaf, if let's just say one of them's name is Doug Mays, he'd be laughing. I'll say, Doug, could you just run as hard as you can run? He said, Coach, Coach, I ran. I, I'm tired. I said, that ain't what I asked you. I said, did you run as hard as you can run? No, sir. I said, well, how about let's run as hard as we can run this time? They take off. Then they loaf on the next one sometimes. And after the same thing over and over. But my question to them is always this. And they know the answer. Did you give me all you got on that particular sprint? And they know whether they did or didn't. You ain't got to say, you didn't run hard. They know they didn't run hard. All I'm letting them do is let them know that I know they didn't. So now both of us know you didn't. So my question to you this morning is, are you giving God all you got every day? You already know the answer, and God does too. I don't know the answer. It's not for me to know, but you know the answer, and God knows the answer. And just like that kid is not fooling me when he loads, he can look at me and say, well, Coach, I ran hard. No, you didn't. I know you did. I'm looking at you. God's looking at you. He's looking at me. And we can sit here and try to tell ourselves, oh, I'm giving it all I got. God already knows. It's hurting you. It's hurting you. Just like it's hurting that kid, and that was my next point, good point. Because when that kid loafs on Friday night, he's locked up. He can't go. 
He's got, somebody's got to play. It hurts him and it hurts the whole team. And when we're not serving the Lord and we're not faithful to God and we're not serving God with all we got every day, it hurts you individually and it hurts the team. Who's the team? This church. Hurts every one of us. When I don't sell out to serve God, when I hold out on God and I don't do my part, it hurts me and it hurts every one of you. And when you don't, the same is true. It hurts you and it hurts everyone. It don't hurt God. God's going to get his work done. If he has to use somebody like Jehu, he's going to get his work done. But wouldn't it be good to be able to use people that sold out? That's what God desires. So my question, back to my question, is God using you in spite of you, or is he using you because you desire to be used, and you want to be used, and you want to be what God would have you to be? So as we wrap it up, what's the lesson for us today? Well, I believe the lesson for us today is simply this. We can absolutely depend on the word of God. If God's word says it, it's going to happen. It's coming to pass. Think about it. Ahab and Jezebel paid a price for their sin. People thought they got away with it. They probably even thought they got away with it. They didn't get away with it. They paid a horrible price for their sin. Jehu, even though he did what God said to do, he paid a price because he wouldn't sell out to God. And so did the people of Israel. All of the people of Israel paid a price for the sins of their leaders and for their own sin because they would not heed the warnings of God. Folks, every one of us got a Bible. Read it. You know, there's some accountability to the people of Israel. Yeah, they had kings that were idolaters, but they also knew what was right. They had prophets going all over the place. God didn't leave them without a prophet. They had prophets telling them the truth, and they wouldn't hear. They wouldn't heed. So uh, there, was, there was enough blame to go around. There was enough responsibility. See, we're all accountable. We're all accountable. And I say to you this morning, from the pastor right on down to every one of us, we are accountable. First to God and to one another. Because if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, it affects everybody. If you don't do what you're supposed to do, it affects everybody. If the man that stands in that pulpit don't do what he's supposed to do, it affects everybody. It affects us all. See, God means business, folks. You need to see that here, too. God means business. They may have thought they got away with it, but when God's time for vengeance came, he took care of it, and it wasn't pleasant. These folks didn't die a pleasant death. They died just like the word of God said they would, in the place where God said they would. You see, we must hear the word of God. We must read the word of God. We must study the word of God. And finally, we must heed the warnings found in the word of God and the warnings given to us by God's people who are sent to bear witness. Our pastor is given the task of preaching to us. We should heed the preaching of the word of God. But that's not all we should do. We should open this book and read it. We should be good Bereans. We ought to study the word of God. Not because we doubt what he's preaching, because it's our responsibility. We got it. And we're going to be judged by it. You better know what it says. God will judge sin, and there is a price to pay. The Bible teaches the wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. Folks, I encourage you today. And I've, I've had to really encourage myself as I read and studied this lesson. I'm talking to me probably more than anybody else. But I encourage you today, the time is now to get serious about serving God. Folks, God's serious about this stuff now. God's serious. And we're, we're playing a little game. Most of the time, we're playing a little game. We show up. We sit through Sunday school. We sing a special and three hymns. We take up an offering. We hear Brother Steve preach. We go get in our car and we go out there unchanged. And we
we do the same old stuff this week that we did last week. And we come back next weekend, we do it all over again. And we're no more serious about serving God a week from now than we were last week. Nothing's changed. We play the game. Folks, the reason we play the game is we've become complacent. We feel pretty good about where we are. Complacency is not a good place to be. I tell, I tell our athletes all the time, there's no such thing as complacency. You can think about this. In your walk with the Lord. I tell our kids all the time, there's no such thing as complacency. You don't stay the same. Every day we go to practice, you work hard and we get better, or you drag and we get worse. We never stay the same. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. What are you doing today in your walk with the Lord? Are you getting better? Are you getting worse? You getting closer to him? Or are you drawing farther away? Because you're doing one or the other. You're doing one or the other every day. And I'll go ahead and tell you, every day you don't read your Bible and pray, you're getting one step further from him. Every day you don't take serving the Lord serious, you're getting one step further from him. And God forbid we reach a point in our life where we can miss church or we cannot pray or we cannot read our Bible and not feel bad about it. Folks, if we, if we miss reading our Bible or we miss praying or we miss coming to church or we miss an opportunity to serve the Lord or be with God's people, it ought to bother us. And if it don't, we've gotten way away from God. And every one of us sitting in this auditorium or in this sanctuary this morning, you know where you stand with the Lord. You know where you stand with the Lord. And I implore you today, please get serious about serving God. Every one of us need to get on our knees before a holy and a righteous God. And we need to ask for his forgiveness and we need to be thankful for what he's done for us and we need to get serious about serving him. Folks, time is short. We're running out of time. Remember, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. He's going to take care of us. He is going to take care of us one day. I don't know when that day is going to be, but it's coming. I know it's coming. And you know it's coming. What are we doing to prepare for? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this day. God, I thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for the things that you reveal to us as we read and study your word. And God, I pray this morning that each one of us would search ourselves. God, we'd see, God, if we're truly sold out to you. God, if we're truly wanting to be, God, what you've saved us and called us to be. Or Lord, whether we're just playing the game. God, I pray that each one of us in here would examine our hearts, and God, that we'd get serious about serving you. God, we'd get serious about being what you'd have for us to be. For, Lord, we realize today that you are serious. And God, we know that, uh, Father, we need to be serving you. God, we know that we need to be faithful. And God, I just pray that you'd give us the strength that we need to, to stand on your word and to be the people that you've saved us and called us to be. Lord, I pray for each one this morning sitting in this uh, auditorium this morning, in this sanctuary this morning. God, that each one would search their hearts, Lord. That each one of us, God, would look and see where we stand with you. That, Father, we would leave this place today different from the way in which we came. And God, I pray for the service today, the worship service. I pray for Brother Mark as he leads us, as we worship in song, that, God, we'd focus on you and singing praises to you for great things you've done for us. God, I pray for Brother Steve as he comes to preach this morning. God, that you've given him the message we stand in need of. And Lord, I pray right now that you'd prepare our hearts to take this, this message and apply it to our life. That God, we'd be the people that you've saved us and called us to be. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all that you've done for us. And God, I pray that if there be one lost here this morning, God, today would be the day of their salvation. But Lord, I also pray this morning if there's one that's fallen far away, Lord, I pray today that they'd draw closer to thee. That, Lord, that we'd uh, uh, 
walk in a newness of spirit this morning as we leave this place. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask these things in your most holy and precious name. Amen. Well, thank you all for your attendance this morning. And your...